Hi, Parkway Manor. Welcome to Wednesday, May 6th, The Chocolate Touch. We happen to be on Chapter 6. If you remember last time we read, John is in school, and he just finished, well, tried finishing a math test. Sadly, he started kind of nibbling on his pencil. All of a sudden, not only did he break a piece of his pencil off, the entire pencil started turning to chocolate. So guess what? John couldn't finish his math test, and that's where we left off. When the others had been excused to go out for mid-morning play, John had to go and stand by Miss Plimsoll's desk. John, Miss Plimsoll said, you mustn't make up silly stories to excuse your failures. I must have the truth. What did you do with your pencil? This is it, John said showing Miss Plimsoll the pointed stick of chocolate. Really, it is. It changed. What do you mean, it changed? Miss Plimsoll demanded. That's my pencil, John tried to explain. Only, it isn't the same anymore. Nothing stays the same today. If I put it into my mouth, the, the same thing happened when I chewed my gloves. They became chocolate, too. John, said Miss Plimsoll slowly, do you feel all right? Yes, thank you, John said. I feel all right, except I'm getting so thirsty. The water from the water fountain turned to chocolate, and so did the water upstairs. I would really like a drink of cold water. Yes, John, Miss Plimsoll said, and she suddenly looked pale. You go run out and play with the others. I'm going to go have a talk with the nurse. And John... Miss Plimsoll said as he started toward the classroom door. Here's another pencil. Be a good boy and try not to lose it. I'm afraid I'll have to keep this piece of chocolate until school's out. You know we don't allow anyone to eat candy in class. Miss Plimsoll put the slightly chewed chocolate pencil in her desk drawer, and John went out to look for Susan. He found her jumping rope with two girls in the class. John usually scorned skipping rope. He preferred things like hide-and-seek, tag, FBI's, spies, kick the can, or any other good, exciting game. Jumping up and down in one place just to avoid being hit by a rope seemed silly to him. But he was sorry for having spoiled Susan's silver dollar, and he was willing to make a sacrifice. Susan, he said. Susan continued to bounce on one foot as her two friends swung the rope over and under over and under, over and under her. She didn't seem to notice John. I'll jump rope with you, he offered. Susan stopped and the rope was caught by her shins. Let's try doubles backwards, she said, but not to John. She ignored John. You go first, Betty. Ellen, you go second. I'll go last. The one who does it the most times gets the first slice of my birthday cake. Susan looked at John, raised her eyebrows, shut her eyes, and stuck out her tongue at him. Then she turned back to the girls and smiled. Ellen whispered in Betty's ear. Betty whispered in Susan's ear. Then all three of them looked at John. They looked at each other again and burst out laughing. Oh, Susan, John protested. I didn't mean to do it. The trouble is, there's something magic about me today. Everything I put into my mouth turns to chocolate. The girls giggled. You wouldn't like it, said John, who was beginning to feel sorrier for himself than he'd ever felt before. I think it's getting worse, he added reproachfully. At first, just the part in my mouth turned to chocolate, but when I nibbled the end of my pencil, the whole pencil changed. Ah, pooh, Susan said, and the others hooted with glee. Maybe I'll get sick and die, John warned. Maybe I'll turn to chocolate myself. Then you'll be sorry. I don't believe one word about the chocolate, Susan said. And if it was true, you'd be glad because all you ever like eating is chocolate. If you don't believe me, John retorted, just you give me that jump rope and I'll prove it. The girls looked questioningly at each other for an instant. But as they hesitated, the bell rang and it was time to go back to the classroom. The rest of the morning passed slowly for John. 
He was afraid that his mother was going to be cross about the missing gloves. She might not accept the excuse that he had eaten them. He regretted his messed up arithmetic test. He was sad about Susan's anger and disbelief. And he was getting terribly thirsty. Once during geography and once during art, he was excused to get a drink of water. Both times, however, he swallowed nothing but sweet chocolate. His mouth was getting stickier and sweeter and drier by the minute. We'll read one more chapter. Chapter 7. All right, boys and girls, Miss Plimsoll said. It's almost time for lunch. Clear up your things. Paint pots securely closed. Brushes washed. Paintings unpinned and laid out to dry. Drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, there's the bell. Front row first. Timothy, you lead, then Robin in a single file line. Go ahead. Now John alone walked slowly in the throng, hurrying along the corridors to the school cafeteria. The school was proud of the cafeteria and the food that was served in it. The room was spacious and bright, with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and all the fields beyond. The opposite side was taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at tables by the time John took his place in line. Enviously, John noticed a boy at a nearby table suck at straws dipped in, dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of the cold, creamy milk. At another table, a group of girls were eating big red cherries. John could almost feel the firm fruit on his tongue and the pleasure of biting through that tart, juicy pulp. Mmm, the cherries must taste good. They must be so thirst quenching. John unhappily took a tray from the pile and slid it along the rails in front of the top of the counter. He put on a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife and fork. It seemed hardly worth the while, but he felt he might as well try the food and drink. Well, perhaps if I eat it a different way, without letting anything touch my lips, hmm. Maybe my lunch won't all change to chocolate. He was not very hopeful, though. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. Oh, I, I thought I heard you say something about chocolate, the boy said. I hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie, he added. That'd be super. Now, on chocolate cream days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course just so that he might spend all his money eating that delicious chocolate cream pie. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie, oh, now suddenly made his stomach feel as though he were on a roller coaster, an uneasy, flibberty gibberty sensation. Oh, John shuddered. Oh, yeah, he commented, wrinkling up his nose. The other boy kind of just shrugged his shoulders and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp, moist lettuce and tomato salad. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, the gold of the potatoes, the pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked delicious. He also took half a pint of milk, a thick crusted whole wheat roll, and a cool pat of butter, a tumbler of water with ice cubes, clinking against the glass, and a dish of fresh fruit, slices of orange and grapefruit and bananas and grapes. John's tray was loaded with just the sort of meal his mother was always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John always thought, oh, it was pretty dull to eat sensible, healthy things when there were sweeter food and drink to eat. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing, and his mouth began to water in a new, sticky way. John paid for the lunch with the money his mother had given him and went to an empty table and sat down, his fingers trembling slightly with eagerness. He cut a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with a promising crunch. 
So far, so good. He stuck the prongs of the fork into a mouth-sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch his wide-stretched lips. John's teeth came together in crisp layers of sweet chocolate. He took a small piece of potato chip. He tilted back his head and was looking straight up at the ceiling as he dropped the morsel straight down into his throat. He felt it go down. Again, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that he sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. Then he became aware of a shocking novelty that he hadn't noticed at breakfast. At the rim of each glass, there was a small semicircle of opaque brown. The bowl of his spoon and the prongs of his fork had also become brown. As John watched, horrified, the areas of magic chocolate slowly spread until at last the entire glass and each piece of cutlery were all solid chocolate. The trouble was unquestionably growing worse. John's scalp tightened with fear. Oh, what am I going to do? He asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what's going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drink and utensils, John stumbled away from the cafeteria and out to the playground. And that is the end of chapter seven, We'll see everyone tomorrow for more of the Chocolate Touch. Have a wonderful day, boys and girls. We'll see you soon.